the previous video, we discussed some of the muscles of shoulder abduction, the deltoid muscle and the supraspinatus. In this video, we're gonna talk about the internal and external rotators of the shoulder. We're gonna begin by talking about the internal rotators, especially the subscapularis muscle. So the subscapularis is one of the four rotator cuff muscles. You can see it here in green. Now notice here, we're actually looking at an anterior view of the scapula. So back here we see the acromion, or the acromial process, and then this is the clavicle. But notice we cannot see the scapular spine. When we don't see the scapular spine, that's an indication we're looking at an anterior view because you can only see the spine posteriorly. The other clue that this is an anterior view is notice here's the coracoid process. And it might be a little bit difficult to tell here uh, just because this is a picture, not in three dimensions but the coracoid process is closer to you. It's closer to the screen than the acromion is. And the coracoid process is an anterior structure, so that's the other clue we're looking at an anterior view. So that means this green muscle has to be the subscapularis. And it originates in this large basin that occupies pretty much the entire anterior surface of the scapula. This would be the subscapular fossa. Name makes perfect sense. So this is the subscapularis. And it too is a convergent muscle. So it has a very broad origin in the subscapular fossa, and the fibers converge to a tendon that inserts on the lesser tubercle of the humerus. This is the only rotator cuff muscle that attaches on the lesser tubercle. As I mentioned previously, all the others are gonna attach on the greater tubercle at different points, and we have the superior, intermediate, and uh, inferior facets for those. Now the actions of the subscapularis uh, one is going to be glenohumeral stabilization. This is an important point for all the rotator cuff muscles, every single one of them. They all play a role in stabilization of the humeral head within the glenoid fossa of the scapula. If these muscles get weak, it makes it more likely that there's going to be a subluxation of the shoulder. And so if you have a patient who is prone to subluxation or dislocation, or maybe they just have some general instability, you wanna target the rotator cuff muscles for strengthening because that is a big job of theirs other than the other ones we're gonna be talking about. The other one being shoulder internal rotation. So the subscapularis is one of the major shoulder internal rotators, okay? Subscapularis is gonna be innervated by two nerves from the brachial plexus, the upper and lower subscapular nerves. And both of these nerves get nerve root contributions from the brachial plexus via nerve roots C5 and C6. And then the blood supply is gonna be via the suprascapular artery, the axillary artery, and the subscapular artery, okay? Now, in case you didn't realize it already, the motion we're showing here, where you start with the arm out like this and you rotate it in at the shoulder, well, this is internal rotation. Sometimes you'll see when you put the arm behind the back as if putting the arm behind the back to the lumbar spine, that'll be listed as internal rotation. That is not true internal rotation. Some people call it functional internal rotation, like you're putting your hand behind your back to put something in your back pocket. But this motion right here going from right to left, this is true shoulder internal rotation. Now the subscapularis is the only one of the rotator cuff muscles that facilitates this movement, but there are other muscles that also help out, and they're listed here. We're not gonna go into these in too much detail in this video, we'll hit them in other videos, but those are the pectoralis major, the latissimus dorsi, teres major, note that it's not minor, we'll see that in a minute, and the anterior deltoid. We'll also see later on that there's many more internal rotators than there are external rotators. And so for the vast majority of people, internal rotation is going to be the stronger movement. It's going to be stronger than shoulder external rotation. And if you think about it, here's a couple muscles here that are pretty large. Pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, pretty strong muscles that can help out the subscapularis. So that's shoulder internal rotation. Now we're gonna get into external rotation. 
So there's two muscles here. One is the infraspinatus. So let's take a look at this picture right here. We're back to a posterior view of the scapula. Again, here's the scapular spine. So we know we're dealing with a posterior view. Up top is the supraspinatus, which we covered in a separate video. And then below the scapular spine, this large basin that sits on the posterior aspect of the scapula, this is the infraspinous fossa. And this is gonna be the origin of the infraspinatus where the muscle belly sits. And as you go outward toward the humeral head, the fibers converge into a tendon, which then inserts on the greater tubercle. And remember that there's three facets. The supraspinatus is gonna insert on the, on the superior facet of the greater tubercle. The infraspinatus is gonna insert on the intermediate facet. Unfortunately, in this picture, there's not a lot of clear differentiation between the different facets and even the tendons themselves but the insertion of infraspinatus is gonna be situated right in the middle. And the actions of this are going to be, again, glenohumeral stabilization, we've talked about that, and then shoulder external rotation. And again, external rotation is just the reverse of internal rotation. So we begin more or less in an internally rotated position, and then just rotating the arm out like this at the shoulder joint, that would be shoulder external rotation, okay? Infraspinatus is going to be innervated by the suprascapular nerve, the same nerve that innervates the supraspinatus. Again, it has nerve root contributions from C5 and C6 nerve roots. And its blood supply is via the suprascapular and circumflex scapular arteries. Okay? So that's the infraspinatus. The other muscle we have to talk about is teres minor, which you can see right here. Part of its muscle belly note is covered up by the inferior portion of infraspinatus and also partially covered up by teres major. Now, one of the important things to do when you're studying is to clearly differentiate for yourself the teres minor from the teres major. Teres major, which is down here, is not a rotator cuff muscle. There are two criteria to be a rotator cuff muscle. Number one, the muscle has to originate off of the scapula. Um, technically, teres major does do that. It originates from the inferior angle of the scapula. But the other criteria is that it has to insert on one of the tubercles of the humerus, either greater or lesser tubercle. Teres minor does do that, but teres major does not. It actually inserts a little bit lower on the humerus, uh, right off of the bicipital groove, which we'll see in another video. So it is not, by any means, a true rotator cuff muscle, okay? Now the teres minor is going to originate off of the lateral border of the scapula. Again, that's being covered up here, but we can see it come out here to insert on the inferior facet of the greater tubercle. Those two facts make it a rotator cuff muscle. Its actions are pretty much the same as infraspinatus. It's gonna promote glenohumeral stabilization like all of the rotator cuff muscles, and it's also gonna participate in shoulder external rotation. Its innervation is different from that of the infraspinatus. It is innervated by the axillary nerve. Again, part of the brachial plexus has nerve root contributions C5 and C6. And its blood supply is via the suprascapular and dorsal scapular arteries. Now, for shoulder external rotation, there are far less muscles that promote this. So if we go back and look at internal rotation, right, there's a bunch of muscles that help out with this, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, teres major, and the anterior deltoid. But if we look at external rotation, we just have the infraspinatus and the teres minor. The only other muscle that participates in this is gonna be the posterior deltoid, okay? So because there are fewer muscles that participate in external rotation than internal rotation, usually external rotation is going to be the weaker of the two movements. And having taken a manual muscle test with a handheld dynamometer and getting exact poundage for force production with lots of patients, I can tell you that this is the case for pretty much every single patient. The only way they probably wouldn't have this is if a bunch of their internal rotators were torn, okay? Internal rotation generally is always stronger than external rotation. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the rotator cuff muscles that to participate in internal and external rotation. See you in the next video. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.